It's been a widely believed truism among the Western public for my entire life that China is the power of the future. That the Chinese are on the verge of taking over the world, and this is the start of the Chinese century. I remember growing up hearing all these authorities talk about how America was an empire in decline, and that we just had to accept the fate that China would replace us, much like America replaced Britain and the other European empires in general over the 20th century. However, I really don't think this is actually true. I think China is about to experience one of the most horrifying social crashes ever in world history in the next few years. I think China is now on the verge of a revolution that will end up becoming the bloodiest event in all of world history, killing hundreds of millions of people. It's been interesting to see over the last five years how China went from double-digit economic growth every year and building a coalition of allies on every continent to where it is today. China today is sliding towards Maoism as it cuts itself off from the rest of the world. Its allies are faltering and their economy is moving to gridlock as protests rock across the country. This is a video to explain the process of how I believe the Chinese civil war will play out. The way I got into geopolitics as a teenager was through strategy games, and I always have a fond place for them in my heart. Games like Star Trek Fleet Command, which is a cross-play game that's available on desktop and mobile with Scopely account, so you can play at home and on the go and seamlessly connect your game. I really love the open world style, which makes space really feel empty and ready to be explored. The game now comes with several new features, including wave defense, a new way for players to interact socially, players defend a central point from waves of increasingly powerful enemies, and collaboration is the key to success. Players can explore the aftermath of the temporal Cold War plotline from Season 2 of Star Trek Enterprise. Enterprise Part 1 also brings a huge expansion to the ex-Borg faction, with a loop featuring new multi-buff Zindi hostiles. There's 10 core Star Trek Enterprise-themed missions, and as many as 10x side missions. With these new features and new officers, such as Trip Tucker and T-Pole, Star Trek Fleet Command is a great game for anyone looking for a fun and engaging game to play. Click the link in the description or use the QR code, and with the promo code WARPSPEED, which grants the player the 10 shards of Kirk, rise to be an admiral with the Star Trek Fleet Command. The Western managerial class has always had a crush on authoritarian regimes, like Communist China now and beforehand for Nazi Germany or Stalinist Russia. Since they are examples of societies where the managerial classes have seized total control of society, I still remember from 2020 when Westerners were talking about how China had done a much better job of dealing with COVID than the West. Alternately, in the 2010s, when academics and people in the media were talking about how China's authoritarian system them, let their economy grow much more rapidly than the West's, which was still struggling with the side effects of the 2008 financial crash. The kinds of parallels which the Western media draws between China and the West aren't exactly fair, since these different societies present themselves to the outside world in the exact opposite ways. The West is an inner-driven, guilt-based society, while China is an external, shame-driven society. Westerners deliberately make their countries look worse than they are, to signal their humility in a Christian dominated moral system. Meanwhile, in Chinese culture, publicly talking about the nation's failings is considered morally bad in of itself for making the group look worse. What this means is that China is racked by severe internal issues that we never hear about in the West. Furthermore, our media doesn't really have the self-interest to explore the issues underlying China. I don't think our media is that intelligent and deep-thinking either, so they just don't notice them. As a general rule, the American ruling class wants China to look stronger so the public gives them more money and power to fight this threat. Thus, the underlying issues that China has gets brushed under the rug. I'm not saying the West doesn't have issues. It has some very serious ones, which I talk about in multiple videos, and I think will end up doing severe damage over the next few decades to our society. That being said, China also has serious issues, which I think will also destroy their society. There are two ways I try to look at history. One is like playing a strategy game, with the bird's eye view, where you look at all the statistics or 
armies and borders of a nation from above. The second is more like a drama or play in which you empathize with the person having to deal with the changing circumstances and figure out what's the rational choice for them to make. Both of these are valid approaches to understanding the world and by combining them you can have a fuller view of the human condition on both the personal conscious level and the macro spreadsheet level. What often happens is that the issues on the macro scale gradually add up in the background while people on the conscious level ignore them. Then once they've hit critical mass the leadership can't deal with them as they become an avalanche. This is almost always how revolutions start and if you ask the elite even a year before the French or Russian revolutions if they were about to happen the rulers would be in complete shock. We're at the point now where the underlying factors that would create a revolution are reaching a fever pitch in China so that the rulers as you're going to see are breaking their backs to try to maintain stability where even they who are insulated from the public realize something is wrong even if they don't know how bad it'll get. China has a series of underlying social issues that when added together in effect doom the communist dynasty. The first one which I speak a lot about in previous videos is aging of which China is one of the countries which has hit the hardest in the entire world. China is on the verge of an incredibly rough period of aging in the next decades ahead. This is a chart of Chinese demographics and as you can see the largest bracket of young Chinese are people turning 40 which isn't really young especially so since China isn't a wealthy country of people who do office jobs but one instead where people actually have to do hard physical labor for their work. Chinese society values youth even more than the West. There's a thing called the curse of 35 for work and 30 for marriage. Companies don't want to hire people over the age of 35 since they demand higher pay and can't work as hard in the 12 hour shifts that are common in China. Women past age 30 are seen as useless and only a guy who's a sucker would marry one. They've lost all their eggs. Women are told to get married at a young age but also Chinese feminism is stronger than that in the West so very few actually do. Humans are biological creatures where our top prerogative is reproduction. Thus when we're not able to start and support our families the entire society falls apart. Over history once the average age of marriage gets above 28 you're gonna have a revolution as reproduction has gotten too difficult. China alongside maybe India has the worst dating and marriage market of the entire world. With the one child policy families could only have one kid and since in Chinese culture only a son can pass on the family name and the wife is supposed to support her husband's family it creates an incentive to only have male children rather than female ones. This is added to in that in China there isn't a welfare state to support the elderly so parents know that a son will better be able to take care of them in their old age than a daughter. In China female fetuses are frequently aborted which means that there are now 30 million more young Chinese men than women. Keep in mind China has over a billion people so that sounds like a tiny number but once you deal with supply side markets you end up with large fluctuations based on slight changes in supply. This is how the price of oil can fluctuate so ridiculously in such a vast range in very short periods of time. This has created a toxic dating environment in China where you hear that to get a girlfriend a man must have his own apartment, TV, and car or things that are very difficult to get all in a medium income country like China. Furthermore the man must give his wife complete control over his finances. What this does is create a large sexually frustrated population of young men. We don't have good numbers in China, but in Japan, nearly half of men under 35 are virgins. And it wouldn't surprise you if the numbers are similar or worse in China, since Japan doesn't have the same gender imbalance. Again, large populations of sexually frustrated young men are perfect revolution fodder. This is very similar to what occurred around the time of the Taiping Rebellion, or the biggest civil war in Chinese history, which was occurring at the same time as the American Civil War, where there was a massive imbalance in the number of men and women. In many ways, China is the most most modern society in the world and that it's done the most to remove pre-modern human traditions. Things like religion, politeness, traditional gender norms, and more have been eradicated more so in China than anywhere else in the world. If you can think of any type of dehumanizing bureaucratic weirdness or postmodern decadence, it's probably worse in China than in the West. China is the closest thing you'll find to Blade Runner or the cyberpunk sci-fi genre in the entire world. China has one of the worst birth rates of any country on the planet planet. As of now, it is half replacement level according to official statistics. However, the Chinese government frequently lies, 
Surprise! And so other thinkers like Peter Zihan think the real number is half of that, or a quarter of sustainability. No matter what the real number is, it's collapsing precipitously and will be much lower, even more so in a few years. It wouldn't surprise me if five years from now, the number of total births approaches zero. A society with a birth rate this low can't survive. What happens when there are five times as many people in their 80s as their 20s? Furthermore, societies are built off social trust, in which once people realize there's no hope in an aging society, it will crash before it actually hits that point. The young have kids, found companies, fight, make ideas, and push society forward while the elderly are dependents. Thus, an aging society becomes a recurring negative spiral, in which less young people produce less resources, which in turn depresses the birth rate even more. This keeps spiraling until complete social collapse. This is a ticking time bomb inside of China. Economic and real estate factors are also profound drivers of this collapsing birth rate. The Chinese real estate market is at a quarter of its entire economy. This is due to bizarre incentive structures that the government puts out. Long story short, local governments can't raise taxes in China except through real estate. This then results in corrupt dealings as local governments artificially inflate the price of real estate to make more money. This becomes a recurring loop in which people invest in real estate since it's artificially propped up, which then results in people investing in real estate since other people already are. I think the Chinese real estate bubble is the biggest and most unstable on the planet. The Chinese invest in real estate with an insane fanatical fervor, thinking it will always return. This is what we saw with the Evergrande crash a few years ago, which is a good encapsulation of the issues of that entire industry. Also, why China builds these ghost cities out in the middle of nowhere, which have no inhabitants since everyone involved makes money off producing more real estate, whether or not it's actually used. The problem here is that due to the ballooning of real estate prices, the average Chinese will never be able to afford a home ever. My researcher ran numbers and found out in major cities an average worker would have to work for over 20 years to pay off a four-sided concrete shack or a hut without running water, heating, pipes, or electricity inside of it with a single room. That means that without the ability to secure housing, people are never able to establish families. China's quality of life economically is completely messed up. What the Chinese government has done is to pump money into the economy for growth, in fact at the highest levels ever in human history, far, far more than the Americans who are also doing a very very unhealthy amount. What pumping cheap money into the economy does is increase the value of capital vis-a-vis -vis labor. This increases inequality, inflation, and weakens the value of actual physical labor. China has experienced the most rapid and largest economic growth ever in human history since the 70s. However, this has largely accrued to the upper class, as has been the case around the world, for the economic growth of the same time period. The average Chinese person isn't starving anymore, unlike under Mao, but they still live in poverty close to the subsistence level as the increases in productivity have been eaten up by higher costs of living due to the increased power of capital. The average urban Chinese, and keep in mind China is now majority urban, lives in an apartment smaller than a horse stall, or sadly, what's getting more common is tenement-style housing, much like the 19th century, where a bunch of people are stuck living in the same room, or as they call them in China, micro-apartments. Working 12-hour days, 6 days a week, or as the Chinese call it, 996, or 9am to 9pm 6 days a week is normal. You can't live a real life or support a family off conditions like that. China has been going through major economic contractions now due to economic squabbles with the West. 40% of China's economy in 2015 was dependent upon shipping manufacturing to America. As the Trump administration turned the West against China, with the shipping industry in leaving it for Southeast Asia, Asia or back to North America. Thus, China's economy has been gutted. This has been combined with China's draconian COVID lockdowns, which completely destroyed the economy. Keep in mind, China isn't a first world country where people can really work remotely. You can't work remotely on a factory assembly line or as a fisherman. This means that Chinese youth unemployment now sits at over 50% as of six months ago. Even if it's half that number, that's still insanely bad. China isn't a traditional agricultural society anymore where if the unemployment's that high, people can hang out in their villages, living off subsistence farming or with their families. Rather, it's an urban industrial one where if you can't find a job, you can't pay off rent and everything else falls apart. The thing is that if unemployment's at 50%, employers can basically do anything to their employees since the employees have no leverage. I've heard that working even longer than 996 has become normal in China, working until 11 or midnight. Employers can basically treat their workers as slaves. These sorts of daily personal indiscretions are the sorts of thing that drive the public over the edge into violence. Furthermore, the parents of young Chinese 
Chinese who can't find work aren't considered useful for the Chinese labor market. Thus, they can't afford to support the young. All of this adds together to create a population which is desperate on a variety of different levels. The Chinese public has no future in a bunch of ways, whether economic, housing, sexually, religious, social, and more. The average Chinese person has no incentive to buy into the system anymore. Something else I want to throw in here is that the other factors people use to stabilize their lives in hard times like religion, community, or social norms are the weakest in China of anywhere in the world. The U.S. is a more friendly and religious society than China by a significant margin. The only other stabilizer the Chinese can pull on to any degree is family. But keep in mind this very severely weakened by the one-child policy, and most Chinese don't live in their hometowns anymore, so they can't rely on family or village connections to keep them going. The Chinese public is completely lost on every single level. What I said there perfectly connects to this next segment. The reason the Communist Party survived in China while communism fell in every other major country in the world is that the communists abandoned actual communism and instituted capitalism in China. The implicit deal that was struck between the Communist Party and the Chinese people was that in exchange for material wealth, the Chinese people would accept the loss of their freedom. As it's become clear that in the last few years that they can't maintain this economic growth, the Chinese Communist Party has jettisoned this promise and instead embarked on trying to oppress the population so much that they can't fight back. This is something that they're actually very blunt about. It's funny to compare how autocracies talk to their citizens versus democracies. The democracies, even if they're doing something unpleasant, have to lie to the public about it. Xi Jinping told the Chinese people to eat bitterness in a public speech which roughly translates to suffer through this, and it doesn't have any positive connotation that things will ever get better. The Chinese government frequently talks about how the Chinese have to return to the harsh material conditions they saw 60 years ago under Mao. It's very clear China's trying to revert back to the Maoist system for a bunch of different ways. Xi Jinping has turned himself into dictator for life, and Xi Jinping thought is taught in schools. They have turned their elementary school system into militaristic propaganda. They train kids to hate the Americans and want to kill them. You see loads of crazy stuff like putting five-year-olds through military training. They openly tell young boys to expect to die in war and girls to breed for the good of the nation. They've reverted to the social conservatism of the Maoist era. They do all sorts of crazy stuff like creating limits on how long young men can play video games, banning images publicly of girls wearing bikinis, or banning home homosexuality. The YouTube channels Lao Wai and Serpensa cover this topic very well and talk about all the new crazy stuff coming out of China now. There are both Chinese speakers who lived there for over a decade and are married to Chinese women. China is the geopolitical topic that I've studied the most, where I've read a tremendous amount on this, and I'm yet to have seen a single thing that those channels have misportrayed or done incorrectly. What I think is going on here psychologically is that Xi Jinping, alongside the entire Chinese ruling class, which are for the most part all old men, who grew up in the Maoist period. Thus, they see that the current generation doesn't agree with them. I think that they think they turned out so well since they had to go through the pain of the Maoist period. Thus, I think they're trying to reinstate Maoism, partly to maintain their power, but also to toughen up the next generation and instill the right values in them. For the nitpicking autists, which make up a large amount of people who follow geopolitics, when I say Maoism, I don't mean the literal Maoism of 60 years ago, where, for example, I don't think they'll go as hard against private property. However, I think Maoism is the inspiration and the closest equivalent to what they're trying to reach, which is something that the Chinese Communist Party literally publicly says. It's very clear that the Chinese government is trying to crack down on the population, with the social credit system and the draconian COVID lockdowns being some easy examples. There are so many tyrannies going on in China right now that it's hard to keep them all straight, whether the genocide of the Uyghurs, the crushing of protesters, the maintenance of corrupt business practices through the friends of the Chinese Communist Party. I think without exaggeration that modern China is as oppressive as Nazi Germany, and I think we're going to find even more horrible things that we don't even know are going on once the government collapses. I think the Chinese Communist Party is trying to reach a level of control over the population which they had under Mao, or at least something in the same ballpark. In that time, men and women had to sleep in government-controlled barracks. People had to write down every every single social interaction they had and submit it to the government for review, and they starved 40 million people while the population didn't rebel while loving Mao. The Chinese government would like to be able to get to the point where they can beat 
beat the population, while well, the population thanks them and asks for more. The Chinese are very plain about wanting to have a war now. They have repeatedly said so in the Chinese media. They have time and time again told the public to prepare for war, especially so with America and its allies of Japan and India. This is something their diplomats have even said to these countries on multiple occasions. I won't talk about what a war like this would look like or even how it would happen. I have many, many videos on these topics, but I'd like to throw something out. In the modern world, we have a nasty habit of our enemies directly saying that they want to do something, and then we're surprised when they do it. Hitler said he wanted to genocide the Jews and Slavs through a giant war. Then the French and British tried to appease him and were surprised when he did it. The communists said they wanted to destroy our entire civilization and that anything was justified for revolution. Then we were surprised when they acted on that. The Chinese are literally telling us they want to do this and will be surprised when they do act upon it. I think the Chinese are trying to have a war in order to unify their population, take power over the public, and kill off some of their excess young men. This is something that we have a precedent for where the biggest reason Mao started the Korean War was to kill off the previous nationalist army. I don't know if China will do this, but they are doing everything they would do if they were to have a war. The Chinese have been stockpiling food, oil, and iron, or other resources for several years supply of isolation from global trade. They've been building up military forces for an invasion of Taiwan. If they were to attack Taiwan, they would be doing exactly what they are. I think they'll attack Taiwan during the next American presidential election, with America on the verge of civil war, and thus probably too divided to support Taiwan. The Chinese Communist Party hates Taiwan since it's a representation of what China could be. Taiwan is an ethnic Han nation, which is a liberal democracy, and much wealthier than China. Taiwan proves that the Chinese can be much better off than they are, and that the Communist Party is holding the Chinese people back. For these sins, the Chinese Communist Party loathes Taiwan with a fervor that's difficult for us to understand. I don't think the communists will in fact be able to strangle control of the Chinese people under the second Maoism. I think that it might work over, let's say, the next five years, but in the long term, all of these endeavors will end up horribly backfiring, thus causing a revolution. This is for a couple reasons, but one of the most fundamental is that no one has any incentive to follow them or die for them. China is split by a handful of binaries. A major one is coast versus interior. Much like America over the same time period, the wealthy coastal cities have done very well and become prosperous at the expense of the hinterland. When most Westerners think of China, they think of the modern coastal cities, not the primitive pre-industrial countrysides, which are in fact much more representative of the total Chinese nation. What the Communist Party has been trying to do over the last few years is to rely on the countryside over the city. The Chinese Communist Party operates like a medieval feudal monarchy, in which there are many hidden power cliques based off different policies with which operate under the surface. The Shanghai clique, which stood for economic liberalization, dominated from the 90s to the 2010s. They're the strongest in Shanghai, of course, but also in the capitalist coastal cities. If you're a totalitarian regime, you don't want any sources of power independent from the ruler, or ways people can organize except through the government. The problem here is that merchant societies often turn into republics, and this wealthy, capitalist coastal region could eventually compete with the Communist Party. This is why Xi Jinping was so brutal to Shanghai especially during the COVID lockdowns, with starving the city for months on end. At the same time, while the Communist Party has been so mean to Jack Ma, the Elon Musk of China, since he represents the entrepreneurial spirit of creativity that they don't like. They try to crush Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is emblematic of this liberal capitalist coastal China. The other faction besides the Shanghai clique is the youth faction. These represent more of a hardline Marxist faction that's based out of the interior. Chinese communist politics are weird, where their rural right are people on the hard left who are socially conservative. This faction runs China now. Then there are centrists who just want to do what the party wants and are NPCs without political opinions. Then the Chinese left is the Shanghai clique, or more liberal capitalists on the coast, to the economic right. The government is trying to use the countryside to control the cities. However, I'm not clear if this is going to work. The Chinese Communist Party views the countryside with complete contempt, and 
the peasants know that. Also, this is a region that's been left behind in economic development due to deliberate policies made by the government. I think the rural elite might support the government, but the actual people in Anhui or Hebei don't like them. The equivalent in America would be if the Democratic Party tried to make the Rust Belt their new center of support, after that region had already faced decades of collapse due to policies the elites had had which deindustrialized it. And the people in that area would feel condescended to and patronized that the elite expected them to support them without offering them anything. The question is what reason does the average young Chinese man have to fight or die for the Communist Party? The Communist elite isn't offering any changes or goodies to young men. There's no cheaper housing or girlfriend at the end of this. The Chinese government just tells the old to work harder and bear more suffering because it's their duty. Another issue is that no one believes in any Thing enough in China to commit atrocities or sacrifice their lives for. No one believes in communism anymore, especially so the Communist Party itself. You need to have strong ideas worth dying for to convince people to do these things for their nation, and China doesn't have any. Most Chinese, especially among the lower classes, don't have political opinions. They just want to survive. The nature of the Chinese spirit is collectivist. It puts up a facade, or as the term in Chinese culture says, face. What a person actually thinks doesn't matter in Chinese culture. The Chinese are willing to bear unimaginable suffering and oppression if that's the social consensus, but once the social consensus changes, they will immediately defect and rebel. You just need to have something that changes that image. There's a concept that goes back 3,000 years in Chinese culture called the Mandate of Heaven. This stands that the emperor is allowed to rule as long as he is moral and decent to his subjects. Once this no longer is the case, the public has the right to rebel and drive the emperor out. China is reaching a point where the mandate of heaven will be revoked soon. Once that consensus takes over the public, they'll have the ability to turn on the communists morally. Chinese culture is all about social approval, and there needs to be some major jolts to get there. I don't know if it would be a failed invasion of Taiwan, a massive flood, the death of Xi Jinping, or anything else. Once something happens which openly revokes the mandate of heaven, the entire social structure of authority will break down, as has happened with the collapse of every dynasty before in Chinese history. I think a failed invasion of Taiwan is a very reasonable start for the collapse of modern China. I've said before in these videos that I think if China would attack Taiwan, it would be a disastrous failure whether or not the US would help the Taiwanese. I think it would destroy the face of the Chinese Communist Party, and it would also arm, train, and provide leadership to an entire generation of disaffected young men who would then turn their guns onto the government. The Chinese government is a lot less effective and powerful than most people, even in the West, would think. In many ways, it's actually less powerful than the U.S. government in its ability to control its own population. This is since there are so many different layers of power that don't trust each other. The Chinese Communist Party is so low trust and exploitive that it builds up resentment across every type of power so that people push their own clique's interest at the expense of the greater good, since they know that no one else cares about the greater good. In governments, the level of functioning of the general bureaucracy democracy is indicative of the military. There are no countries today with tax systems that don't work, but with exceptional militaries. Every single endeavor the Chinese Communist Party has pushed recently has been a failure due to squabbles and inefficiency inside their socio-political structure. An example was with the COVID lockdowns, which were enforced very differently on a local basis. The stockpiling of food has been a failure in which local governments bought out rotting food so it was useless. The attempt to establish a social credit system was a failure since local governments wouldn't share data and all had different rule systems than each other. Every single major effort the Chinese Communist Party has pushed has been a failure. China today is very much like France before its revolution, with an autocratic elite which is able to negotiate power with local elites through various obscenely complicated and corrupt dealings. Local princelings and governors in different provinces of China border upon independence at times. The Communist Party is unable to crack the very dense local connections and power relationships. If the Chinese Communist Party falls apart, the local governments could keep on operating pretty easily as the country falls to warlordism, much like what happened with the collapse of the Manchu monarchy in the 20th century. A faction that will end up becoming kingmaker in this coming struggle will be the People's Liberation Army. I've spoken in countless other videos about how the loyalty of the army is the most important factor in determining the result of a civil war or revolution. The People's Liberation Army exists almost as a nation within its own parallel 
economy of factories and farms, which it uses to sustain itself. It also has its own complex network of corruption and relationships, which exists independently from the rest of the Chinese Communist Party. Xi Jinping has been trying to curtail the independence of the People's Liberation Army, often for good reason as a way of cutting down on its massive corruption. I don't know about the political loyalties of the Chinese military, but in the same manner as the French or Russian revolutions, I could see the soldiers siding with the rebels, which would then permanently destroy the Communist Party's power. A big factor here is that the Chinese Communist Party is representative of China's elderly. It's a very old ruling power. As that demographic grows older and loses any leverage through actually doing stuff over the population while making ever-increasing demands on the young, I can see that dooming them. If the young Chinese, who also staff the military, see a future of slavery for their entire lives to the elderly, I can see that becoming the instigation for a revolution. This will be a major turning point in Chinese civilization. Veneration of elders and parents is the highest moral good in Chinese culture. Once we reach a point of a war of children against their parents, it will be an unbelievably traumatic point in the Chinese psyche and over Chinese history that will be seen as a turning point for millennia afterwards. A moment of civilizational shame, possibly equivalent to the Holocaust in the West. This will be in the long term likely a moment of profound reckoning that Chinese future philosophers will spend centuries coming to terms with. I can also see a scenario where the Communist Party sides with the young, killing off the elderly. The CCP has shown itself to be completely unscrupulous, unprincipled, and evil already. The Communist Party of China is the organization which has killed the most people in human history by a really big margin as of now. However you want to look at it, I really don't know how China is going to deal with its aging issues on the scale they have them while they're not a wealthy country. The problem is that they're already so old now that these aging problems are going to keep them poor so they can't become wealthy fast enough to afford to deal with their elderly in a nice way. I don't really know how this crisis is going to play out if I'm honest. However, from looking at all the numbers and how desperate the Chinese elite is acting now, I know everything is about to fall apart. It feels like a hurricane is gathering in China. A spirit of chaos so profoundly strong is emerging that no government can manage it. I think China will collapse into war lords. I predict hundreds of millions of people will die. If you compare previous Chinese dynastic collapses, in which it's not uncommon for half the population to die, that would be the normal outcome here. There are certain moments in history in which the stillness can be deafening. The silence is so loud that it crushes you with its power. Where I grew up, in most days of the summer there were thunderstorms. And before a great storm, the birds aren't flying, the air is still, and the sky is dead black. It then starts to dribble, and then the rain comes down in sheets. In a couple of hours, the creek starts flooding. Modern China clearly can't demographically sustain an urban population. Over the process of generations, the Chinese will move back into the countryside, where they can have a stable birth rate, and they'll be able to grow their own food. China will go through these horrors, but when the storm clears, I think China will be much like the country it was 200 years ago. Maybe that's an exaggeration. I think it's possible a new religion or entire civilization will emerge from this soulless society's collapse. If there's a Chinese prophet in our time, I would give anything to meet him. Fans in China, hit me up if you ever see him.